Nehemiah, we're in Nehemiah chapter 4 and 5 today. We're going to conclude the study next week. So I hope you brought your Bibles. What have we seen Nehemiah doing from day one of the study? We've seen him rebuilding. We've seen him be reawakened during those six and seven months of prayer. We've seen him be reassured by a great God. A couple weeks ago, we've seen him revived. And if you looked out on the little sign today, resolute and reaffirmed, he is that. And we're going to look at the resolution and the reaffirmment through problems. If you've been studying these four chapters, and wait, wait, David left something out in chapter two. Dave, why isn't David talking about the problems? And I just wanted to save up for and kind of put them all together. You know, there are a lot of churches that won't talk about problems. You know, and I'm not here to criticize. You're never going to hear me criticize a leader, a Christian leader. And I'll tell you why. And there's, there's a couple people I have in mind. Because early in my days, when I only knew the Lord, I followed that ministry. I needed that voice. It might have been a motivational message. Okay? It might have had laughter in it. But that's where I was 20 years ago. And even though you move on to new ministries, they were still a part of my life. And I won't come back and criticize them for that. They're responsible to God. But, you know, in, in today's time, we have what's called... You've all heard this. The false prosperity gospel. You're not going to hear that from me. Everything is fine. Don't worry. It's going to work out. You know, that's not true. Problems come into our life. And as you know, the last four weeks, we haven't talked about it, and I owe to that. But I wanted to just save this for a few minutes today. There is going to be problems. There are going to be problems. There's going to be opposition. You know, when you look at the word resolute, I'm big in looking up in the dictionary. And yeah, I actually do have a dictionary. It weighs one, you know, do any of still have those five pound dictionaries? I remember I went to Bible school. I was the 50 year old student with 19 year old kids, and they all had computers. Well, they just go on the computer and they type, and they go, What do you do with that huge book? You know how, you know, you know what I'm talking about when I say dictionary? Now, I still go to the old fashioned, just like the Bible, I still hold it. Resolute, you're undaunted, you're unwaited. Nothing's going to stand in your way. And as we'll see this with Nehemiah, it's not Nehemiah, it's not the people, it's not the it's the Lord that gives them the success in that. So we're going to see Nehemiah being resolute and reaffirmed. But you know, in this day and age, can't talk about that. I'm just going to preach good. And while we want to do that, you can't deny Life. I mean, Dawn, your family's been on my heart the last couple of days. Claude's family's been on my heart. Donna's family's been on my heart. Troy's family has been on my heart. These are people who've recently gone home to be with the Lord. And you want to just pat them sometimes and say, it'll be okay. It'll, and that's false. But let's not remember, behind that is Christ. Behind that is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that wants to bless us. And I love that last question. And again, I, I, I really don't think I put these lessons together. I think God guides me. I love that last question on your lesson. In everything that happened, and this is a yes or no, do you believe that God can get you through everything? It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Many of us have lost loved ones. We're going to lose loved ones. Many of, does God get us? Now, can people and loving friends help? Yeah, they're a part of that. But it's God that gets us through those things. You know, speaking of the race yesterday, I ran a 13.1 mar half marathon. Drove down to Danville. I've been training for this seven, eight months. and I really think God got me through that race. I ran a great race. I ran faster than I did. I had nothing left. And at that 13 mile, it was almost... Stop and walk. I couldn't do that. I had to do it. But, and I'm talking races here. But we've got issues in life. If not, you're going to have issues. I'm sorry. You know, as I look at the youth over there, life is great. Love life. Be a child of God.
what you're going to have, I'm sure Brett and Mandy have shared this already, there's going to come issues in life. You're 10, 12, 14, 16. Look back at your life. Okay, 10, 12, 4, oh my goodness. Do, does anybody, those, well, we're not going to count you on it, uh, but does anybody want to go back and be 13, 14, 15 again? If you do, I want to see your hand because I don't, I don't want to go back. Probably the only exception I want to go back is I'd probably better at technology. You know, I could probably come to some of the youth and say, I know nothing about setting up a blog. Yeah, Sheila, that's my problem. Tech, I, I don't know how to do everything. I'll, so I'll sit there for 20 minutes and mess with it anyway. So I don't want to give you the false prosperity gospel. There are problems in life. There's going to be problems. Everyone's going to have problems. We're going to look at a couple of them here. I hope you can relate to that. I hope we can relate to that as the church starts reaching out, looking to do things, looking to reach out to the community. Um, I just want to say, had a blessed day. I was coming down 15. I thought, it's almost like the car pulled into the, the police station, Silver Lake. I want to meet the chief of police. I want to say, hey, we want to do a barbecue or something for you. Who do you think is standing out in the middle of the parking lot? The chief of police. And I said, you know, Pastor David, uh, um, I'm not being pushy here. Because you're that non-denominational church. That's what he called around the corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I said, we'd like to do something for the police force and the fire department and the paramedics. And we're going to try to figure that all out. But it, it was so easy that there was a part of me that thought, don't stop there. You know, that, again, that's that opposition. You're always going to have opposition. And if you get nothing out of this, and I always say that, but I hope that, there's always going to be a spiritual warfare that goes on in your life. In this human life, we won't have it in the next. When you think of Tom, when you think of Troy, they don't have that spiritual warfare. And I, I'm trying not to dream it. You can't imagine how great it's going to be that day. But we're going to have those problems in life. Nehemiah has some. Right at the beginning, chapter 210, when Sanballat the Hornite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Got to remember, Nehemiah was an outsider. King Artaxerxes, who would be the president of the world back then, gave him complete authority. He comes into town, Jerusalem, and he has authority and power. What do you think that does to enemies who have authority and power? Uh-oh. That's who these guys are, these enemies. We're not going to talk about Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem, but again, these are enemies, but they're also internal people. They may not be Jewish people. They know the Jewish people. They know how to play politics. They know about bureaucracy. What did I say a couple weeks ago? What is worse, external opposition or internal? And you all said internal. That's what we're going to see here. But I want to make the point, Geshem, the Arab, they're not Jewish people. But they're a part, they're a part of Samaria. They don't want these walls to be built. And if you don't have any opposition, again, let me tell you something. There is going to be opposition. It's called the evil. And I call them the evil one. I don't want to give them, the evil one is going to be there. The evil one was telling me last night at 11 o'clock, as I said, you know, David, your throat's a little raw. You've run this race, you're tired. And then God said, yeah, but Dawn already put the bulletin together, okay? Well, David, you start quitting on me. And I thought, no, i got to do this. And I had been running around all day. I was kind of wound up. And I thought, no, I'm going to put it in God's hand. So you're always going to have that. Don't go to church today. Stay home, watch online. And if you haven't figured that out, I love the people online. But if you're able to come and fellowship with us, we want you here. There's nothing like fellowship, Okay. And if you're sick, stay home. If you've got to put the mask on, put the mask If you've got to social distance, do that. We never said, I, I had a theory at my last church, let's not be stupid, people. If you've got to wear the mask, do it. It's okay. If you want to social distance and not hug, it's okay. We want to do that. We want you to do it. And if you are sick, then stay home. But watch online. So there's, good, there's goodness online. So he's got some enemies here. We see, and in the verse I read um, at the beginning, uh, chapter 2, 19 and 20, 
But when Sanballat the Hornite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem, you ever heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. Are you being mocked by anybody? Are you being ridiculed? Does Satan mock you? He mocks the living daylights out of me. I can't tell you, and this is not about, I can't tell you the battle that I went through the last three or four months in praying for this position. You can't do that, David. It's not going to work out. This church will be loving. He's pounding away, and he knows he, he knows he can get to me in certain ways. And you different. I mean, your, your ways might be, for me, I'll tell you what it is for me. It's pride. It's I can do everything, and I can't. I can't do everything. I can only, but they'll pound away. And if you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior, he can't get that. He can't get your heart, but he can kick you around and he will kick you and he will be, he will. And God allows that. Think, God allows that. Why? I don't know. It's one of those questions to ask him. Did the Father allow Jesus to be tempted for 40 days in the desert? Yes. Here's the bottom line. That last question on your lesson. Because in every situation, God wants us to turn to him. You know, Lord, my throat is a little sore. I am a little nervous. You couldn't see, but my right foot was doing this one during the song. You couldn't see that. So what I, God said, press down on that pedal. Mike, I don't know what those three pedals are, but that last one is, that last one does something, does I still don't know what it is. And God said, press down on the pedal. Then my foot wasn't doing that. So anyway, I get nervous too at things. And I thank God. He wanted me to come say, I'm a little nervous. But I'll get through this. I'll give you the praise. And I'll focus on you and I'll sing to you. And if you and if you sang to him, we're singing to him. When we get so lost in ourselves, that's where we get into trouble. Ridicule. You got people ridiculing you. What did Nehemiah do here in verse 20? I answered them by saying, The God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. This is a guy, Nehemiah, who didn't get into battle and fight with this guy. We sometimes do that. I can fight. I used to have a dear loved one who said, I'll get in the ring with the devil. And I thought, Ooh, be careful with that. I'll take him on. Be careful with that. And I know, I know what he meant. He was a very dear man. I love. He was very successful. But I don't, I don't think I want to do that. But... That, that opposition is there. It's going to come through people. Um, Nehemiah didn't argue with them. And I want to go back to a, a verse I love. It's in Jude. Most of you maybe remember Jude is that little one sh chapter right before Revelation. It talks about the, the archangel Michael burying Moses. Remember Moses died on the mountain and God buried him. He saw the promised land. But Michael came to bury him. And who shows up but the evil one? And the evil one wants to start a problem. Let's go back to Genesis 3. Where did the problem start? That snake showed up. And it's not a real snake. It was Satan in the form of a snake. The apple looks good. The apple got better. They bit the apple, didn't they? Because you get in that conversation with it. Nehemiah didn't get in a conversation with these guys. But what does he do? He turns to prayer and says, this is God's project. Is the same thing true here? Are we doing, as we talk about rebuilding, and is this for our purpose? No, it's for the church. It's to give God the glory and the praise. And Nehemiah is not going to be Mr. Politically Correct or anything. He knows that these people are not on his side. He knows their enemies. Um, you know, one of my all, again, I don't recommend movies, but one of my all time favorite movies is The Godfather. I don't know if you like it. I know it's about mafia and all that, but, um, you know, when you look at Marlon Brando and Al Pacino, and they're all such great actors, you know, there's a point in that where the dad, Marlon Brando, is talking to his son, and he's aging. He said, Son, come here. Um, uh, love your friends. I'm not saying this right. Stay close to your friends, but keep your enemies closer. Know what they're... And this is what Nehemiah did. He didn't say, oh, that's okay. Those three will never bother anything. He knew that they were enemies, but he didn't get into a political... What did he do? He 
pray. Now, some of you want to take your gloves off and get into the box. He didn't do that. He prayed. Now, we're going to see some more problems. These three characters are not gone yet. More things are going to happen. As we try to reach out to the community, as we try to reach out to people, to come, are we going to... Are we going to be met with opposition? It's going to happen. I'd like to say every door you're going to knock on, people say, I'll be there Sunday. Now, some will. You might have to take them out for lunch after. I don't know. But that opposition is there. It doesn't stop here. Let's remember it's about the confidence in God. You've brought us so far, God. Are you going to let us go? No, he's not going to let us go. He's, he's not going to turn away from us. I go to chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed Jews. And in the presence of his associates of the army of Samaria, he said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from these Heaps of rubble burned as they are. What does Nehemiah do in verse 4? Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their head. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the ghost. Let's remember, while they are working, Nehemiah continues to pray. He didn't push the six or seven months of prayer. I said, He's still praying. He's praying with a heart probably beating a little faster. He's probably a little nervous. He's probably fearful. There's eventually going to be death threats on this guy. Nehemiah is like David running from... Nehemiah, they will eventually want to assassinate Nehemiah. So sometimes when we pray, it's a simple prayer. Sometimes it's, there's a lot of fear. Joshua chapter 1, i got to take these two million people across... The, of course he's nervous. It's okay to have a little nervousness. But it's what you do with it after you go to God. Now move forward. You might have some issues on your heart. And you say, I'm fearful about that. He prays. And they're working. Ah, there's another plot. I'm in chapter 4, verses 7. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs of Jerusalem had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted to come together and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this. You know, we're not going to probably have people in our front parking lot here to pose carrying signs, I'm against this church. But never forget there's the spiritual warfare that's going on. You might have that when you reach out and invite somebody. So just just be aware of it. But again, God has a plan on this. The problems don't stop. You got to remember, these people are doing incredible things, working night from morning to sunrise till that sunset, day after day. And we believe that the half that wall, that project that I'm going to close with next week, 52 day that miracle, they're about four weeks into this. They've got the wall half built. People can see the success. These enemies can see the success. And they're going to rev up the negativity. Now, Nehemiah isn't stupid. Oh, that's okay. God, Nehemiah is also aware of what's going on. And we need to be aware of what's going on out there in the world as well. Um, someone would say, well, wait a second. Why shouldn't we be loving to these three people? Why shouldn't we just show them mercy and grace? I'm not saying we shouldn't, but Nehemiah knew what was going on. These were enemies that were well-connected with the Jews, they knew what they were doing. And it was wrong. It was against God. So Nehemiah is putting this in God's hands, but he's praying. He never, never stopped praying. You're saying, David, did it, get, did it get worse? Yes. The physical exhaustion set in. The people, had been, the people are tired. You know what I'm talking about someday. Morning, noon, and night, day after day after day. You're physically exhausted. You know, a number of people lately I've been praying who have been taking care of a loved one. I won't mention a name here. Day in and 24-7, it never ends. 
You get exhausted. Even yesterday at that 13th mile, I almost stopped and walked. I'm not comparing that to somebody going through an eight with an alien spouse, but you get exhausted, and you got to come back to God. And the people were tired. The people were tired. What does Nehemiah do? He encourages them. Verse 10, chapter 4. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the labor is giving out. And there is so much trouble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Nehemiah not only continued to work, he encouraged them. And that's what we need to do, friends. We need to encourage people. You got somebody in your neighborhood, they're not churchgoers. Don't just be a bull. Someone wants to, don't be a bull in a china shop, David. You know, banging into things. Can you imagine a bull let loose in a china shop? Just banging things over. We have a tendency sometimes to do that in Christianity. I do too. I have to be careful about that. We need to be loving, compassionate, kind, and encourage people. You're saying that's that's enough, Dave. Ah, as we go to chapter 5, the internal stuff really hits. The economic crisis comes in. you got to remember, these were all farmers. Imagine, you've got a lot of farmers here. You're farming morning, noon, and night, and suddenly for the last four weeks you've been asked to take care of the walls and the gates. Is the farming struggling? You bet it is. You can't do that. They start. They have an economic crisis. There's a food shortage. And three things happen, all internal of the Jewish people, not these three enemies. So while this, all this is going on with the enemy, Sanballat, to buy a guest, and they're doing their ear, and Satan's out there loving it all. Pound away. Pound. I don't want that wall built. I don't want that miracle. I don't want people to see the glory of God. The same thing is possible here as we reach out one person at a time. There's also internal stuff. It's economic stuff. They're tired. I don't hear in this book they're complaining. You know, one of the, one of the stories I love, I love the story of Exodus, and I'll tell you why. These people, wow, wow, they complain about everything, okay? I mean, God finally got this, and this isn't good, and I don't have enough quail, and I don't have enough. They complain, and they complain, and, and God still loved them, but it made God angry to them. You know, wow, 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 when's that? When's that? When the, and then they see the Red Sea open, and Pharaoh, and, and you think they'd say, this is a great God. They continue to whine. I think the people in this story, I think they're just tired. I think, what happens when you get tired? You get discouraged, don't you? Now, sometimes when you're out there by yourself, we were talking about this in the Bible study. We're afraid to ask for help. And you go, 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 and you get tired and you get discouraged. I mean, I don't care. 11 o'clock last night, I got a moment of discouragement. I thought, bail on the song. Don't sing a praise song to the Lord. And I want to encourage you not to listen to that voice. Say, God, I need your help. I can't do it all. And thank you, Lord. He was there. People lose loved ones. Reach out to God. But let other people help you too. And this is what Nehemiah does. Three things are going on here. No food, they had to mortgage their land. Ooh. Number two, they had to borrow money or they had to sell their children in slavery. You know, you wouldn't think the Jewish people, slavery, you think they would have learned from Exodus. So all this economic stuff. And here in the back are the Jewish finance people just making a ton of money. I'm t- I mean... I don't know if there's any finance people here, bankers. Is it fair to charge a good rate? Is it fair to be capitalist? I have no problem with that. Is it good to make a little interest? But to, to, to make 10, 20, 30 percent, they were, it was exorbitant is the only word I could do. They're just taking advantage of their own people. What does Nehemiah do? Nehemiah jumps in the middle of that. It tells us in chapter, at first he's angry. You know, the question's often asked, Do you ever get angry? Well, you better raise your hand. I do. But then do you slow down? Jesus was angry. 
Did Jesus have a right to be angry in the temple? Yes. He didn't hurt people. That's a different story. He had a right. That was sinfulness against his father in a house of prayer. So anger has its part. But he, Nehemiah kind of chills. He goes to prayer. He goes to, and then he gets busy. He gets with the authorities. He gets with the financiers. He gets with the bankers. He says, friends, we can't do this to our people. The mortgage, they're going broke. The borrowing of money, they can, and, and then the selling the children to slavery. We can't do this to our people. What is Nehemiah? Nehemiah as leader brings them together and they back off. So see the enemies out there. Wow. See the internal crisis of physical exhaustion. And then see the internal folks who, no, we'll give you a 2% interest on that rather than a 20%. I don't know what the rates were back then. Nehemiah helped them. But he did one more thing I want to talk about. Nehemiah, as the governor, was blessed with a lot of benefits. And one of those things was a food allowance. He would basically feed 150 people every day. That's a big party. Can you imagine trying to feed... Leonard's back to shake and said, can you imagine us feeding 150 every day? Okay, I'm sure you had beef, and we got chicken, and we got, you know, think of the food we got to do for it. Think of the food we'll have to get ready for the police officers and the fire department, the first parent. I don't know, 10 or coming or 50. But we're going to eat, aren't we? I mean, think of, think of it. Nehemiah didn't want to take advantage of that. So he shared and gave his portion away. Now, that doesn't mean he didn't eat. But he didn't want to sit like a king in the palace taking all the money, taking all of the, the rich rewards, and then saying, you, you bankers are wrong. You mortgage, you, you people don't do that. Nehemiah showed what leadership is all about. We need to continue. Now, as I talk about leadership, what does that mean? I think that means showing the love and the light of Christ. I think that shows the compassion. People seeing that you're loving and merciful. You know, and... I'm sure you run into people like I do, and it's just, does your heart break for them? My theology over the last five years through God is making me more compassionate. Because you used to see some say, oh my goodness, you know, you think about that. I'll give you an example for me. I'll be the dummy, I'll put myself out there. I'd see somebody with, this is 10, 15 years ago, so you're safe. I'd see someone with a load of tattoos. Positive or negative impression, and I get negative. I don't do that anymore. Do you know how many churches right now are worshiping with people with leather jackets on, and they got Harley Davidsons, and they got bikers, and they got tattoos? They're still children of God. So I'm growing. I'm learning. You see some people who are totally down and out. Does your heart break? You see some people who are so arrogant, yet your heart should break for them. They're lost. We can do the same thing as Nehemiah. Maybe you won't sit down with the bankers, and maybe you won't have a national campaign to get rid of the debt or whatever. But are you showing that compassion to your people? Again, you're thinking, well, we got the enemies over here. Man, we're physically exhausted. We're, we're down. We're hurt. Oh, I, I don't think I can. And then you got the economic crisis as well. All, again, everyone is an opportunity to do what? Go back to whom? The Lord. Pray about that. I'm sure yesterday for some of us was a time of deep reflection of what happened 20 years ago. I want to show this. We're all getting ready to run the race. You know, we're all stretching and, you know, let's go. With... And God bless the director. He took a minute to say, uh, we welcomed us. A soldier gave a uh, minute test. God, I love one minute testimonies, friends, okay? So if I ever give you the mic here, I don't do 10 minute testimonies here. But I, and, and he gave a simple testimony. This gentleman sang the national anthem. 
And then we paused for a minute to remember the 9-11. I don't know about you, but I got a little emotional. It wasn't about me running a race. Because, you know, maybe some of us know people who are connected to that. They're still hurting. And that compassion should come out of us. So all this is going on. Nehemiah is leading. Nehemiah is still praying. And let me share this. The wall is continuing to be built. Not for them so they can pat themselves. Not for just security. And we'll talk about that next week. What does that wall mean? What does that miracle mean? I mean, when they step back, I can't. We've tried for hundreds of years and we can't get this wall built. But in four or five weeks, you know, the wall gets built in 52 days. It's going to happen. You know, the thing we don't want to do here is get a 52 day calendar. Okay? I used to do this. I swear to God, I used to do this. 52 days. You know, I love Nehemiah. I know. And here's what's going to happen in those 52 days. You know, probably what's going to happen to me. Because you can't base it on 52 days. I think you can have a good heart and say, I want to be a better Christian than that. Oh, I'll do this and I'll do that and I'll do that. I remember years ago, I'll get on a diet, okay? I wasn't healthy. And I'll start exercising. And Oh, I'm going to go to church more. That's good. And I'll tithe a little more, Lord, you know. And we're going to see all this great stuff happen. You're listening to your past. That's insane. And I'm writing goals. And you know the person I didn't even go to on it? I didn't even go to God in prayer. So there's nothing wrong with setting a goal. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But you've got to let God lead. So that wall is being built. Those enemies see that. When you're out doing the work for God, you know who's seeing that. The evil one. And as I was talking, I want to talk about, and I'll close. Um, the Jude 9 quote. Michael the archangel is there and Satan appears on and wants to get in a debate. And even the archangel Michael does not debate him. He does not take the evil one on. You're thinking, well, wait a second. He's the great archangel. You know, there's two camps today. There's a camp that believe you can that you are more as Christians, born again. There are camps today believe that you are more powerful than the evil one. And there are camps where I'm in that I have God within me. And there's only one who can take him on and rebuke him fully. And that's God. Let me throw this in your lap. If you truly had the right to rebuke the devil, you'd get rid of him today, wouldn't you? You'd have, but you can't do that. And sometimes I watch people, oh, you can do anything. You can put, now, what am I saying? We need to go to the Lord and, Lord, rebuke him. Rebuke him. Rebuke him. Don't listen to him. That's what Jesus did in the desert. Because what would I, I, if I had, I'd get away with that. And we don't want that. We don't want any evil in the world. We don't want that. So just be careful. Even though we have Christ in us, the day that I said I can take the evil one on and beat him, I'm in trouble. That's where Eve got into trouble. She started to fall in line. I can do all this. I can still eat that apple. And I'll be godly. Uh-uh. That's not what God wanted. And everything fell apart there. Do I believe we have Christ in us? The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do I believe we can ask God for it? Do I believe I can say, God, rebuke him? I did it last night at 11 o'clock. Lord, rebuke him. Rebuke that voice that I can sing today and still preach. And God follows through with that. And I'm not talking a big thing here. I'm talking simple stuff. But God wanted me to come to him and say, say, this is David. I'm going to get you today. I can't take, Michael did not take the evil one on. He said, only the Lord can rebuke you. I think Michael, the archangel, is a little higher in power than I am, even though we have the Lord in us. So that's that's it saying, I'm going to get in and I'll work with the devil. Be careful about that. I'd rather say, Lord, I'm in your camp. Every day I have spiritual warfare. It's going to happen. 
Do you think the evil one wants to see one new member come to this church? Of course not. I don't want you to reach out in the community. Oh, you can come and sit and you can tithe and you can sing a song, but yeah, that's all good. But I don't want you to get out in the community. I don't want you to reach. I don't want, want you to text a friend who's struggling. I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to pray and I don't want you to talk to him. So that spiritual warfare will be there. But thank God we have somebody even greater than that to defeat him. He's the defeater. He's the victory. Not us. When I start thinking I'm the victory, then I'm in trouble. I'm, I'm the person, boy, that apple looks pretty good. But you'll sometimes hear some people saying, just take the devil on, just rebuke him. You've got to be careful about powers. I give that power to my God, and I let him work through me. So you can go to God and say, rebuke him. Get away from me. And God will do that. A lot going on here. Enemies will be there in life. Economic things will come and go. You know, every one of us could probably come and say, let me tell you the cycle of my economics. You know, we got married, we were young, we had a mortgage, we struggled, we got we had three kids. Up and down, up and very rarely does someone just go like this. Whoosh. Husband or wife loses a job. Kids struggle with finances. You gotta help them. There's always gonna be those economics. And I wish it, it doesn't work that way. We won't have to worry about it in the next life. Nehemiah doesn't argue. Nehemiah doesn't play politics with these guys. Nehemiah is smart, though. They're enemies out there. Even a pastor may have an enemy. Love them. Be careful about bringing in the circle. When I say that, you can bring them into the love of Jesus. We want it. Just always be cautious. Nehemiah is a smart man. He's a smart leader. He doesn't play political games with people. You know, many people did. Oh, that's okay. I want to tell you one story and again I'll close. From another church, another time. I'm going back 10, 20 years. And I hope this never happened at this church. You know, when you're putting boards together and committees together, you know, sometimes there's that person in the church that they're just a pain in the rear end. I'm sorry. Well, let's put him on the board and he'll settle down. Or she'll settle down. Okay? And then she'll back off. And the church did that. It was a pastoral search committee. Did the problem settle down? Uh-uh. Did she become a thorn in everybody's side? Yeah. Was the whole path? Everybody in the pastoral search wanted to quit. That one bad apple in the bud, God love her. So be careful about playing politics in the church situation. She was, by the way, she wasn't the right person for the job anyway. You know? A recent story from a couple years ago. Well, we, we, we need a new elder, okay? The, all the elders, well, we, we, you know, the bylaws say we got to have three elders, you know? Well, there's Jimmy. We'll call him Jimmy, okay? Jimmy's a good old boy. We'll put Jimmy. Jimmy does not have the qualifications to be an elder. He's a good man. He's a good, but he doesn't have the qualifications. What do they do? They stick him on the board. Does it turn out positive? Opposite. Why? Because you want God to guide that process. You think by putting him on the board, it didn't change things. And most of those counselors, they just, they, they start off, oh, I think this will change your attitude. It doesn't. Nehemiah didn't invite these enemies on board. He, he was smart enough to let them go. Now, but Nehemiah stayed true to his focus. Let's not lose. What's the focus here? Is it fighting the enemy or is it doing God's work in your life? I hope it's doing God's work. And letting God love you. and Say, you're in a tough pickle here. You're in a tough crisis. You can come to me. I already knew this was going to happen to you thousands and millions of years ago. It's a health crisis. You know, I've gone through that stage four cat. Whoa, with, with cat. I've gone through that. You hear news. Somebody's sick. A love. Wow. You know, I like to put my arm around and say, it's okay. It's not that we're not trying to reach out, but things come up in life. And we need to reach out. I, I'm glad I got my loved ones. I'm glad I got my 
But in the end, who are you really thankful for? It's God. By the way, who brought those loving people in your life? God did. God did. We're going to close this next week. And again, this was just a quick six-week series on Nehemiah. We're going to look at the miracles. But I wanted to bring and say, there's always going to be issues in life. In this life, it's going to happen. You all could come up and talk stories and stories of how good God, and I hope you'll do that a little this week. I'm thankful how God worked in my life. I'm thankful how God taught me some lessons. I'm thankful that God showed me love and mercy and compassion every single moment. Every, when I have been rebellious I'm, and I have been against him and I've been going my own way, and he's still that loving Father, that loving Jesus, that loving Holy Spirit. You know, as we close, where are you at with issues in your life? I'd like to say, friends, you won't have any. That's not true. It's going to happen. Some things we create because we're not living properly. But even if you're living, things will come in. You know, the, the one thing that always gets to me, it happens in every God, blessed community in America is... And I hope I don't touch anybody's hearts the wrong way here. But there's always that beautiful kid from high school who just graduated who gets in a car accident. He's gone. He's 18. And has had his whole life ahead of him. And I'm not saying he was doing anything mis- and, and they're gone. Or a beautiful family with a young daughter and she suddenly comes out of leukemia. I turn those things over to God. I can't figure them out. Your pastor can reach for you and pray with you and cry, but he can't figure those things out. But I do believe that behind that, through the night, that sun will shine. Through that fog and that rain, the sun will come again. And we're going to see that in this story. I hope we see that and continue to see that here at Silver Creek. Where are you with issues in your life? Problems. Have you given them to Him? Now don't do this. Don't give it to Him and then take it back on Monday. I'm giving it to you on Tuesday. By the way, I've done all this stuff. Okay, I've done it all. And I want it back. You know, David, you're doing too much sometimes. You need to let go. Yeah, but I think I can outsmart him. I can do it. You can't do it. And some of you got a smile on your face because you've been there. I'm a man or I'm successful. I can do that. Sometimes God doesn't want you to do it. Let's learn from Nehemiah. He went to prayer. He was smart. He didn't invite them. He didn't invite them into the fold, those enemies. He went to his own people and said, Let's work this out. Let's help each other. Get away from the interest rates in the morgue. Help them. Don't say I haven't been sell their kids in, in the slavery. Now maybe we don't have to deal with that issue, but we might have other issues. Is the issue maybe that you've walked away from Christ as we get ready to sing this next song? I don't do this every Sunday, but maybe you need to make a rededication to your life. Maybe there's somebody out there, it's possible, you don't have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you're listening online, by the way, you never want to forget that. There's probably, I always believe, there's somebody out there who thinks they're going to heaven, they're really not, and they need to commit their life to Christ. I always open the altar here if anybody wants to come forward and pray. I totally believe that this is a loving church. You know, there's still that fear that why is he going forward? What's going? I mean, it goes on at the best church. Why is he? I haven't seen him go for 20 years. He must really. I hope we don't think that. And I don't believe we think that way. here. I believe anybody ever did come forward. I think you'd pray for that person. But if you're online or you're here, you, do, you, you need to say that prayer to Jesus. It's, it's very simple. It's, Lord, I'm a sinner. I don't know you, but I want you in my life. I know you came, you suffered, you died, and, and three days later the Father raised you. I need to put my trust in you as Nehemiah did. I need to call out to you. And I believe you can save me. We believe that as a Christian family here. Maybe you just need to make a rededication to our Father. 
Father, we thank you for this. We thank you that we can still talk about problems, but with a joy because we know who is in the problem. You didn't cause the problem, but you allowed it to happen, Lord. And as I pray for my brothers and sisters, so there's, there's a lot going on in every life. Young, middle, old. There's health things. And while we're not building walls of Jerusalem, we are going through life. We are building family. We are building marriages. We are building community. Father, there's enemies out there. There's people lost as well. Help us to continue to do what Nehemiah did. Pray and pray and pray. And I sound like a broken record sometimes with prayer, but Nehemiah did that. Help us to encourage somebody. You know, Lord, I thank you yesterday, and this isn't to pat me, but I was saying hi to a few, a few people at the starting gate, and many of these people had never run a race before. And I said, uh, enjoy the race. Don't go out too fast. Finish well. Give God thanks. And that's all that... They needed a little encouragement. They were scared. Lord, help us to, we're not running races today, Lord, but help us to give encouragement to people. It might be that officer in the next booth who says, you know, officer, thank you for being a police. Thank you for your firework. Thank you for being a paramedic. Thank you for what you do for our community. And we all think everybody says that, but we don't. Help us to be a source of encouragement. Even if it's good morning, Lord. Father, I thank you for the encouragement of this church with me. The love. And the only thing I can say, friends, keep doing it with other people who need that. Father, thank you for today. Help us to sing this next song with joy in our hearts. And thank you, Lord, that you're always in the midst of every crisis. Every problem and opportunity can be turned into something different. Maybe you can't go back to the old. But Lord, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a little silence. I love that silence. And what I want to do before we sing this song, I just want to take 30 seconds. And it's okay. Let it be silent. Right now, everybody just talk to God for 30 seconds. Maybe it's a praise. Maybe it's a thank you. Maybe it's a confession. Let's just go to our Heavenly Father for just a few moments and talk. Thank you, Father. Now help us to open up our hearts and continue to worship you.